back everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy. This is the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, and we have a very exciting guest today. You probably remember Jim Thomas. You've seen him on our channel before, and we have him back for another exciting episode. So Jim Thomas is one of our trainers for the Colorado Center for EFT, and he has a lot of experience and background working with high-risk populations, which is going to be our topic for today. And one of the places that you guys might see this population is in agencies. And I know a lot of people have been asking for resources on how to work with this population, especially because agencies don't tend to promote EFT very well. So thank you again so much, Jim, for being on our channel today, for being back on our show, and for talking to us today. Well, thanks for having me, Annabelle. So tell us a little bit more about how you would kind of classify or define high-risk populations? Hmm. Um, higher reactivity at the amygdala level, mm -hmm. um, higher, uh, more, more higher risk um, behaviors often in relationships or with, with self, mm -hmm. more co-occurring problems, less resources, um, higher insecurity and attachment style, more complex cycles, um, and often co-occurring uh, complicators like addiction, trauma, um, severe neglect, um, and, and things like that. It's a, the process level, that's how I think about it. Sure. So when you say higher reactivity at the amygdala level, so we're kind of talking about the survival instincts, and these are probably folks that have been in gangs, um, people that might have lived on the street. Um, let's see, how else? People that, you know, do drugs or high in addiction, you know, and, and usually with that comes a particular kind of lifestyle. The family of origin is usually not so affluent either. So usually they're low on resources, basic human survival resources. So they've had to find different ways to survive in the world, I guess you could say, to survive and thrive that, you know, yeah. set them apart, create high trauma and such. Well, I've, I've broadened it beyond sort of maybe like gang membership and um, um, I, I think about high risk populations, not necessarily also just socioeconomic factors, but yeah, but the context is really important. People are often under resourced, sure, and they're um, experiencing oppression and marginalization, um, but, but also often high risk people uh, show up in mental health centers with chronic um, presentations around, uh, you know, what we've in the DSM, you know, um, put into like a mental illness category. Um, and their attachment relationships and attachment bonds have been highly stressed. But some of these people, in my experience, right, I, I had to kind of learn and understand. So I grew up professionally working with what, what kind of talking around and about high-risk populations um, to recognize that these are human beings in tough situations and often are some of the just the most precious caring wonderful people that are just stressed out and, and mm -hmm. don't don't have um, often all the available resources and actually live in contexts where it's tougher to access resources based on yeah. minority status or, or relational status or something like that. Um, that yeah, so that yeah. sounds like that's one of the big defining factors or, or one of the areas where this really separates them from the rest of the population is they might have minority status, really a, a lack of resources or, or a lack of ability to get to the resources that they need. And that creates a whole lot of trouble in and of itself for them, putting them at higher risk in some of those ways. Am I getting that right? Mm. I have to pause and think about it. Um, I don't, I think it would be 
more useful for us to think about a continuum of risk and resources and things rather than separating into a certain population. Sure, sure. Yeah. Just by separating though, I'm trying to help some of our folks understand how this population is a bit different from who they'd see in private practice and how their problems might present a little bit differently. Right. Well, maybe a way to talk about it is, is you know, so, so people that are out there, um, the culture of working in agencies um, and then some people maybe work in a mental health center or mental health agency. Some work in what are kind of known as like child welfare agency programs um, with kids who suffer neglect, abuse. Um, they have school problems, they have legal problems. Um, then there's other people working in agencies more focused on addiction. And in the, in the addiction field, there can be quite a contrast before between like a Medicaid-funded nonprofit addiction program that's just barely getting by, and maybe a, a a program in Florida or California, Utah, or something that's more privately funded. Um, and then you have the aspect in agencies of whether or not you're dealing with court-ordered um, people. For example, in a, does this person have to come to my mental health agency and do some treatment because a judge told them to versus they volunteered versus their doctor recommended it in the child welfare agency? Is this family coming to family therapy with me because they want to or because they have to? Did I come to the addiction program because I want to or because those, those factors? Yeah. Um, so that's a big difference between private practice. You know, when I, I worked in agencies for years and when I started my private practice and people would write me a check and say, thank you. That was a different cultural experience than I need to meet with you because you're going to write a report about me. Right. The report is going to go to a judge or something and impact my families, whether we can be unified or something like that. Um, yeah, but, which puts a lot of stress on them as well, knowing that, you know, whatever you write in that report could affect my fate and the fate of my family. And that's yeah. really scary. So one thing I learned to do from an attachment perspective, you know, I, I came into agency work. Um, uh, I started working it's in divorce and separation. And then I, um, I did a little bit of work at a, where I was uh, on 24 hours a day at a, a halfway house for people with chronic schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. yeah which is really, you know, just a powerful experience. I, um, I remember once uh, sitting with a woman and first time I really talked to her um, and we were having lunch together, eating like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at the, at the halfway house. And as I was thinking, wow, she's so lucid and we're having such a nice conversation. And then she closed her eyes for a moment and she kept them closed. And then I, some, I don't remember exactly how long she popped up and said, Oh, whew. and I said, what were you doing? And she said, I was keeping the antichrist from taking over the world. And all I could think to do is say, thank you. Mm -hmm. right? And then she talked to me for a while about this is her life work. You know, she fights the antichrist and it's part of her psychotic presentation. And mm -hmm. it's really getting to know that people are people, no matter what this, whatever is happening mm -hmm. to them, people are people. And then I moved I into, that. Yeah, working with, um, I did my internship in grad school at a place called Denver Children's Home, and I'm, I was working in a, it was called short-term diagnostic at the time, but the kids were there 60 days, and we were trying to assess them and their family and their situation and come up with the best treatment plan, and they were mostly, you know, they were teenagers, multi-stress families, a lot of diversity, um, and kept getting that what really people all want the same thing, they want they want respect, they want connection, they want to be valued. And I worked there 12 years and I worked with a residential program. I directed that for a couple of years. And then that led into starting to consult like, with mental health agencies and child welfare agencies with schools. I mean, that's another form of agency work is if you work within a school setting that, that I forgot. But in all of these, just realizing that a lot of what's happening when people have to use public resources in this way is they're coming in and they're often coming in and they're getting labeled. They're getting the, the funding follows a category yeah. and for me to get funded, I have to have a problem. I have to have a diagnosis so that this family can't get family support from 
human services unless they have a problem. You know, you go, you go down to human services and say, we're just struggling in a lot of, uh, at least back in the day. Well, what's the problem that's going to get you support? Um, mm -hmm. Kind of a catch-22, right? If, if you're asking for help without a problem, you must be doing well enough. Um, so just yeah. that, that learning and attachment perspective that people are people and how do I meet people where they're at? And I think that's the fundamental thing that I would say about what we're talking about like high risk population or people that are struggling and having to take advantage of public resources that aren't always as well funded, et cetera, is we all basically across all these experiences want safety, belonging, we want to be valued, we want to have a purpose yeah. that we'll be able to contribute. Yeah, I love that. People are people. And you're so right. Often, especially in, in agency settings, whatever type of agency, because there's all types. Um, you know, it's true. They come in, they have to get labeled or categorized so that the agency can get funding so that they're able to get the coverage they need with Medicaid or whatever public resource. And so often clinicians have to abide by the label and they start analyzing or diagnosing and they fail to see the person behind who just really needs empathy mm -hmm. needs to be felt and understood and seen as a person even if they have i love you know with your client with schizophrenia i mean that's so amazing instead of diagnosing the voices that she's hearing and thinking gosh this this person's off their rocker you're coming alongside her and saying, you know, thank you so much. I mean, that is so beautiful. And I can't think of a more powerful way to align with someone in that place. Yeah, no, I, so, so in my internship, I, I was, a, I'm, I had a family therapy internship and I'm, I'm getting these, you know, really complicated families with generational histories of trying to, you know, fit in a culture often people of color and trying to make themselves work in a kind of white dominated, uh, you know, uh, culture and, 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 and function and, and, and succeed and, um, and coming in and, and, and having to learn in that context about sort of my, my privilege in a different way and learn about, um, having, you know, black families teach me, um, to quit beating around the bush and get more real and, and, um, uh, getting thrust into doing a lot of in-home work. I ended up doing a lot of in-home therapy and then ended up developing a couple in-home programs for agencies and Latino Hispanic families really teaching me that we, we want to know something about you. We want to know that you have a dog or a kid or something, share something about yourself. Don't just come in here with your, your tie and your, your notes and stuff. And, 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 um, uh, um, and 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 uh, the, that that realization of, of and the fun of agency work of, of cross cultural cross economic cross gender cross relational orientation communication that when you bridge that gap um, that with our humanness with our humanness and our shared you know while respecting I mean it's very complicated because it is different to be you know black than white it's different to be Latino it's different to to be raised by a single mom or be raised by your ex step grandmother, you know, it's different to be, it's different to go and it's different. <laughs> you know, I had a powerful experience. I'm running a group at Denver Children's Home and this one young gentleman tells me I live in a castle. And I'm going, I don't live in a castle. I live in a low end suburban neighborhood that I could barely afford the house. And a couple of weeks later, I dropping him off. Um, I need to drive the van, transport, and um, I'm dropping him off. And he's, it's in an alley above a, a mechanic shop. I see this little one bedroom apartment. And I said, is that where you guys live? And I said, yeah. And I said, I thought you had like 14 people living with you. And he said, we do in this one bedroom apartment. And then the next time I was in group and somebody said, I live in a castle. I said, I do, mm -hmm. I do live in a castle. And I need to understand that. I need to understand how that changes my experience. And so I got fascinated by that part of agency work is that the, the culture of the agency often 
you know, that, that we're, we're often dealing with people that are really struggling and maybe I'm making a decent income. Not that agency work is best pay in the world, but, um, and that cross-cultural, cross-boundary communication to, to, to do that in a real way where I recognize my privilege was, was actually became rather addictive to me. Um, yeah. I got stubborn. I want to reach across this and see if we can find a bond with each other that respects our differences and honors our, you know, honors your struggle. Um, but that you're not going to keep me out by just saying you're just the clinician. And so one of the things I did, you were talking about the court stuff. Um, I wrote my reports with parents mm -hmm. and I, and, and if they wanted me to write something that wasn't true, like, you know, write that I'm really cooperating and then say, well, you're not showing up for many family therapy sessions. How do we write about that? And then writing that together, you know, really collaborating and trying to yeah. break down the clinical in hierarchy. In the process, like right. the EFT. Right, yes, and that's yeah. the thing that I kept finding, you know, I didn't discover EFT itself till 1998. I started this agency work in 1989, but I was attracted to Bowlby and Mnuchin and um, and, and to Rogers and Satir and these kind of people that was all about connection at some level and just found over and over again that the biggest resource a clinician provides is, is to be a safe, secure base and a safe haven. And, to, and then that leads to another one, which is the translation of this is what this agency or program is focused on and how can I, how can I, find out what you're focused on, what's motivating you being here, and start to translate that yeah. with you and treatment planning and organizing resources to help you get the best for you because it's your lives. And yeah. that's the thing that often when you have to go to an agency, it gets lost that it's your life because of getting categorized and funding following um, categories yeah. and stuff. So you said just a couple really important things. So I want to tease them apart and hopefully not not lose my markers because I want to unfold a few of these. So I I just love this aspect of the humanist that across culture, across uh, economic status, across religion, race, whatever, we're all just humans underneath. And and the clients in those settings not only long to be seen as a human, but they also want to see us as a human. They just, they don't want to see some dry, stiff person that's completely out of touch with them. You know, they want to see the human side of us as a clinician, and, and that can be a major way of joining with them. But I wanted to ask you if you, because I know I experienced this as well, and, and you've touched on this a couple times, so I, before I came to EFT, I also did my internship, my practicum in college at a substance abuse outpatient facility in lower Manhattan. So definitely a lot of diverse uh, uh, culture, a lot of high risk. And a few of them had a hard time, you know, like I really, like you, I, I love humans. I love people. And I want them to know my heart, to know that I want to help them, that I want to be with them, that I empathize with them. But sometimes they also stop at my, I guess, lack of diversity. They, they saw me as this, you know, suburban white chick. What could she possibly have to offer me? I did time on Rikers Island, <laughs> you know. And so if, if we have folks out there who are working in agency settings like this and run across this, how can they help the how can they communicate empathy or help the client to feel safe with them well the first thing that comes to mind to me is that i've never been to rikers island and um i would want to know what that was like and i want to be able to find the part in me that could have ended up in rikers island i think this was the biggest from an attachment humanistic place for me was the realization that um, that 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 folks were that were in trouble? For example, the the family somebody had been abusive to a kid. Um, the the kid who was truant and not going to school. Um, the kid who was thinking about getting jumped into the gang, or the the parent or grandparent that was 
you know, very disciplinarian and didn't want to know the child. They just wanted the child to follow the rules or the parent who was, didn't know how to say no, you know, to find out why, to find out more, to get curious, which goes back, you know, our previous talk, to be curious about what is it like to be at Rikers Island and what is it like to have to deal with me as this white male or this white female or this, um, this maybe black clinician who may not understand your Hispanic experience or this straight clinician that may not understand your gay experience or this, you know, gay clinician that maybe doesn't get me as a heterosexual, you know, whatever that difference is, the, the, uh, uh, the burden is on me to understand. The burden is on me to, to bridge that gap. And then the second thing that kept happening to me was how humbled I was by people's strength and resilience. And the more I understood their context, the more I found myself just saying, oh my gosh, you've been through that and you're still showing up. You come to meet with this skinny white guy in his tie at, at Denver Children's Home. And you take the bus and you have to catch three buses and come across town and you show up. Um, and I just, my respect and, my, and, and how much I learned, I learned, I was constantly learning about people and life and myself and my limits and my, um, and, and I think it, it really begs the, like, the importance of understanding people's context. And, and like Sue says about emotions, right? There's, she's never met an emotion that she couldn't make sense of when she had the whole story, right? All of the, 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 the more and more as I, um, well, you know, I, the, a psychi I, we got lucky too. You know, a lot of agency stuff has to do with the culture of the agency too. And I got lucky. I, I came out of my internship into a day treatment program led by a very, very good supervisor and had a great consulting psychiatrist. And he used to say to us, he would make us really celebrate the kids that we made it with. And then he talked about take a photo or a video memory of this kid and the work you guys did with them, with school, their, their, you know, their education, with their behaviors, and with their family and all these things because somebody else is about to come in the door that's gonna look unhelpable or difficult or be oppositional or say, I don't want it to do this program. And you need these memories to fuel you to start over, to push that rock back up that hill in the hopes that you can reach this kid. And he told us once when we wanted to refer this young lady who was disclosing all this sexual abuse we had experienced and we were getting overwhelmed and we wanted to send her somewhere. And he said, you're the foreign legion. And this kid has a relationship with you. Who do you think can help her better than this? Well, we don't know about this. And he said, well, I'll help you with that. And Sharon will help you with that. And together we'll walk her through this because she's telling you. She's letting you guys know. She's letting this program know. She's letting this team know. And so for me, it was a, the, the more I learned from and stop seeing it as like, I'm here to help, is um, I'm here to be in it, to be in the struggle with you. And, and whatever resources I can offer, I want to resource you. But man, you're resourcing me. I learned so much about myself in this 16 years of agency work. And there's times I still miss that, like intensity of that teamwork where you're carrying all this stuff together, right? Mm -hmm. You're all carrying it together in this parallel process um, that sometimes in private practice, even in group practices, you know, you don't really get to carry stuff together in the same way. Yeah. So. That's so amazing. And I, and I love that, you know, you said something very powerful and, you know, when you're talking about the guy from Rikers Island, you said, I'd like to find a part of me that could have ended up in Rikers Island. and you know, part of me did want to resource that at that time. And, and, you know, and we'll come back to this point is a lot of them will, will kind of fight you off at the beginning. They don't want to let you in. They don't want to let you close. They don't trust you. But I love, you know, the making sense of the emotions, getting to know what it's like for them. And you learn so much. And that's really the EFT way is to be able to come alongside them and you know with empathy and understand yeah if i were in that situation if that were my life you know i probably could have ended up in the same situation or i might not have made different choices if those were the resources i had and and i learned that so much from some of my own clients at the center as well you know i learned a lot more about what it was like to live in the projects about what it was like to 
be caught in the gang environment, which in and of itself is a cycle that's very hard to break. Mm -hmm. And I understood it on a very different level. And it was so emp empowering. It was so informational, so helpful. I mean, I just learned so much about the human side, which again, a lot of people fail to see when they're kind of classifying people and labeling them, you know, as according to their criminal record or whatever the courts say or the drug or whatever. And they just, they stop at that and they don't see the person and they don't come alongside their experience. And that's super powerful. And so, but a lot of these guys, because they have those tough exteriors, they've not had a secure base, you know. Um, well, and some of them, you know, kind of finding what they get from, you know, like being in gangs or whatever else, you know, oftentimes they get their needs for emotion support, you know, brotherhood met through that. But so for a lot of them that ha they're high on survival, as you said, high reactivity in the amygdala, they're on fight or flight, they're on guard survivalists. When you are trying to align and understand their experience, how can you help clinicians find a way in past the initial guard when you try to show them, I want to understand, I want to know about your experience. And they're like, well, psh, why do I want to tell you? Because again, you're, you know, whatever. Yeah, why would you want to tell me? That makes sense to me. Yeah. I'm just some guide in some program and you know, mm -hmm. your, your PO said you have to work on your addiction and you don't see any problem with smoking pot. And you say so you do a little Coke now and then you don't do as much as your friends do. I get it. I'm just a pain in your ass. And, uh, and so what do you want to do with this hour we have to have together three times a week, you know, while you're in day treatment. Um, and I think also, you know, I, I mean it at the deepest level, finding that part of us. I, I had to work with a, a person who, uh, who killed somebody and I was stuck with them and they were in denial. And, um, and it really wasn't until this uh, counselor, uh, God, I just had her name and I forgot it. She, but she called me out and said, you know, you, you've got to find the part of you that could have killed somebody. Well, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But humans are violent. Yeah. And so then when I did, I tried to find that and accept that. It was amazing. This, this young man had no idea I was doing that. And all of a sudden he started telling me more about what happened and came out of denial. And, oh, my God, I think I killed him. And his first question to me, you know, we've been working together a long time. He said, do you still like me? I do. And do I have to tell my parents? I think they already know. But he needs to tell me. And to, to, that, to, to go into the, the, the places people can find themselves um, and really try to live it with that real empathy and stuff. I think we're also, you know, these are attachment styles. We have to demystify them. There's, a, there's withdrawal that can be, you know, cultural. It can be around, you don't get me. It can be around, you don't understand my socioeconomic situation. You don't understand what it's like to go to prison. You don't understand what it's like to be, live where there's gunshots. You don't know what it's like to live with a chronic mental illness. You don't know what it's like to be a single parent. You don't know what it's like to be, that these are, can be like emotional withdrawals. We'll do all the things we do with emotional withdrawal and EFT or EFFT. And others come in and they're protesting, this program's not helping me. I'm, you know, I'm gonna call the director again if you guys can't figure out how to get me on the right meds or deal with my son's addiction. Then what do you got there? You've got anxious, harsh pursuit. What do you do with anxious, harsh pursuers? That, and respecting context that matters. Context matters. People, it's, I haven't experienced a lot of oppression and marginalization for being a white male. Um, we have researched now that, you know, health out outcomes amongst people of color are significantly impacted by their daily experience of oppression and marginalization, um, that, that, that they have to think about their skin color every day, and I don't. And so to go in and try to understand that when these kids were teaching me, I had one kid, Let's go to the convenience store out here at 7-Eleven. Let's go to the 7-Eleven, and we're going to do an experiment. This young black man, he's 14 years old. He said, I'm going to try to hand my change to the clerk, and you try to hand your change to the clerk. And there was a black guy behind the counter. 
and you would not take the young man's money and you took mine. And then this kid's like teaching me about what it's like to have black skin. And I had to try to find my black skin and put that on and say, what would that be like? So really to get into it with people is to get into, um, to, to get in, uh, you know, I had, to, I had a kid who's, his, his caretaker, his mom says, we're gonna go see the social work lady, He's six years old at McDonald's, gets him a happy meal, the social work lady shows up, mom says, I have to go to the bathroom and never comes back. And he never sees her again. He was, he was like 15 years old and he didn't want to talk about it. It's no big deal. Well, I believe in attachment bonds, so I know it's a big deal. And I'm going to come find you. I'm going to play hide and seek with you. I'm going to find that part of you that got lost at McDonald's that day. And it may take a long time. And so to me, that's there, there was an wonderfully compelling addicting quality to trying to reach in and find people who had no reason to trust systems no reason to trust programs um and to work on so that led me to try to want to help impact the culture itself and the team itself so that we could all co-create teams that were supportive of each other because it's hard work when you're dealing with chronicity right and when you're dealing with chronicity and crisis and things in some of these agencies, you know, like addiction treatment rates aren't that great. If you're in a mental health center and you're dealing with chronic people who've been depressed a long time, who have intense anxiety disorders, you know, or, or um, their bipolar is out of control and things like this, and you're, you're, you're having to show up and see like 32 clinical hours of chronicity you need to be wrapped around with some love and care and support. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the part that makes sense. That's what what I love about Sue and EFT is always, you know, look for the part that makes sense that you can align with. And, and so much of what you were saying was just pulling me in and I, I felt very touched, you know, as if I was there, you know, and finding that part, you know, that real human part of me that could have killed someone that could have been at Rikers Island that could have done this you know it's, could be it's, shooting up I could be a heroin yeah. addict right or I yeah. could um, I mean and, and when you think of marginalization you know anybody who's ever been bullied now take that to the nth degree and multiply it across every day of your life for years and years and years you know to where it's more than just them picking on you them not you know, their first instinct about you is negative and we don't trust you and you must be up to no good and we're harassing you or maybe we're physically abusing you. I mean, imagine what that would be like to feel that every single day and that can help you get into those shoes and feel how awful. I mean, it, it's awful to be bullied. Now take it to the nth degree. That would be awful. And so you start to understand their survival skills, the, the coping strategies that they've had to adapt and when you can understand that, it, it's easier for them to feel you alongside them to feel like you're not standing in judgment or, you know, and, and it's true with the agencies, a lot of them don't trust because they've not experienced a human who's wanted to come alongside them and understand them and, and see their human side. They've, you know, a lot of them have experienced bias and judgment and further marginalization in, in the old school days of agencies. I think they're working to get better. But, you know, so of course they don't have a lot of trust or especially if they've been harassed by the police or social workers or, or any other resource that was supposed to help them but didn't really help them. Of course they're not going to trust us. Of course they're not going to see us trying to benefit them but check a box and send it off to the court and that's not really what we're about. Right. And I'm sure so, so many of the clinicians listening, you know, are doing their best with what they have and they're trying to, to show up as best they have. And, I think part of it too is that every agency, there are these cultural aspects of the agency um, from, you know, what's the board and CEOs sort of take right now? What's important to them that trickles down to you? What's the funding source wanting and how's that shaping what's yeah. happening? Um, That's a huge are, impact on this, on the agency setting and it has, a huge impact on how you're able to do treatment and I mean it, it's so it's very political in a lot of ways and it has such a profound impact on the environment sure and then budget you know like what is the the, the heart 
of any agency, when you ask that question, and most people will start talking about the values and stuff, and it's like as an administrator, I used to say, no, it's cash. Because without cash, we can't function. And so you have administrators that are trying to figure out the budget part and often clinicians that are just, you know, just want to help or social, you know, the social workers, case managers. Mm -hmm. And you get these tensions within agencies, you know, you get tensions between the folks that are maybe want to do more attachment based work and the folks that want to do more cognitive behavioral work and the folks that want to do. And so I know that can be really complicated is what's the culture of the agency and how cohesive are we? And then one of the things I say for people who are trying to apply EFT and EFFT or do individual um, EFT, which um, like I was just in London and uh, Lori Brubaker was just does wonderful workshop on, um, um, and she's going to be in Denver doing that in a couple of weeks um, uh, on individual applying EFT with individuals. Um, is is how is this agency I'm working in, this mental health center, child welfare agency, addiction program, et cetera, is it, atta is it attachment based? Which is rare, rarer unless you're working with like very young kids, then you'll see that, right? Is it attachment friendly? So it's not really attachment based, but if you come in and start messing with the treatment plan and the program, it's nobody's gonna argue. Is it kind of attachment neutral? Like people don't know what you're talking about and they may passively kind of oppose it or they just don't really know or is it attachment averse we need to divide these people up they're too dependent on each other they're too mashed they're too fused we need to you know um and so i think that's a big thing that impacts how we apply something like eft in an agency is what is the culture of the agency from your colleagues your immediate supervisor you know the clinical director the CEO and board, the funding source, how do they feel about an attachment-based, more emotional, you know, focus on human connection as the primary resource? Because really that's what we're talking about, right? That the primary resource available to the human, Sue keeps teaching us, is, is healthy emotional dependence. That when I know I belong somewhere and I'm accepted and cared about, everything else is a little, the the hill of life, as Jim Cohen says, may still be the same you know, same incline, but it feels a little easier to walk together. Yeah. Is there a way that, that clinicians could have a conversation with the clinical directors, the CEOs of these agencies, if they are in an agency that's maybe attachment neutral or attachment averse, um, and they want to be able to have the flexibility to incorporate that in their work? Well, the nice thing, yeah, you have science on your side, so you can pull together. You can show them like the research on EFT. You can show them, you know, the the abundant research on the central importance of attachment throughout the lifestyle, or I mean, the lifespan, um, and and try to educate. You know, some of that, to be honest, has to, it's a it's a level of how empowering is this agency and will they listen and will you cause yourself more trouble if you speak up and how do you speak up is so contextual do you do it in short little boom 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 over time do you make a big proposal do you just work together to do something different and when somebody notices like your families are showing up more and your teenagers are getting better results what are you guys doing um how you create that change is is so i would it'd be arrogant to say you should go do this because yeah. you know in some some places speaking up i mean there's a whole you said there's a yeah. different political structure in some agencies and yeah. there's chaos some agencies are very chaotic some are so cohesive and rigid to a fault you know some are in that flexible middle where your agency um, yeah, I was fortunate. The agency that I was at for my practicum and internship in college kind of let the therapist have free reign to, right. to treat the clients as they wanted, as long as the notes were right, right. You know, yeah. to translate. Yeah. So well, can you help therapists? Because this question has come up quite a bit is to the therapists that do have that free reign that want to do the attachment work, but then their notes by the agency or Medicaid or whatever are demanding specific formulation um, how can they kind of translate their EFT work into something that will be appropriate for the notes or, or work for the notes the powers that be well one of the things we I developed we developed together at 
at the uh, Denver Children's Home and Outpatient, when I was clinical director, um, we started, we organized our clinical formulation around view of self and view of other. And so we sort of, sort of spoke a language that was very relational while being able to touch on these sort of, say like mental illness symptoms and stuff. So we would have a, a descriptive, you know, describe the, the client then describe their context. You know, Billy is a energetic 17 year old young man, with a lot of passion. who doesn't take no for an answer very easily who lives with, you know, describing his context and views the world views others as, which makes sense because, and views himself as, which makes sense because, and results in him being a very energetic young man who doesn't take no for an answer. And we started to create these circular formulations. We called it um, a circular formulation that was relational, but touched on the individual parts that, that the paperwork wants. And this would start to become the treatment summary over and over again. Um, and um, so that, that was a way to bridge using view of self and view of other to the intra-psychic and the interpersonal and bringing them together in your formulation. And if you have a good clinical formulation, then your treatment plans and objectives and your, you know, yeah. and interventions flow from that. Right. Then it's easier to start to work within the paperwork limitations to, right. you know, we're focused on more vulnerable communication between stepmom and daughter mm -hmm. because we think they're, the tension between them exacerbates this the identified patient's anxiety disorder, you know, and it doesn't cause it, but it doesn't help it or something. And so you start then from that cl clinical formulation to float down into a treatment plan that feels more relational and respectful of context and, you know. Um, that's That sounds fantastic. And well, Jim, this has just kind of been mind blowing. <laughs> My mind is blown. This is oh, really okay, cool. okay. I, don't know how I did that. I'm just talking about the experience and the passion. I miss but it this, in a lot of ways. Is, yeah, so it's so amazing because because you know a lot of us in private practice, you know, I like to say the population I get to work with. Most in, in at least my private practice is the worried well. <laughs> and I, I kind of like that <laughs> because it is very intense, you know, working with the high risk populations. But I, I definitely have had a lot of experience working with them as well. And there's so much to learn from them, about them, about their humanness, about our own humanness, about people in general. And I love, you know, the, the really important nuggets that you've given us, you know, about you know, learning to find that part of you that could have done, you know, whatever it is that they've done, being able to come alongside them and find that bit of them within you and use that to show empathy and, and help to build a good alliance with them because many a times they don't trust others. They don't view, they've not had a secure base. Right. They don't view clinicians or agencies as, a place that's going to help them or is out for their best interest. And so trust is really high, you know, building, building trust for them is very important and it's very, you know, it's an important part of aligning with them and building a good alliance and, and empathy showing up for the human side of them, putting pathology. You know, aside. when you're, t you're just before we close, I, I'm thinking and feeling and remembering, you know, and going back through this journey, and really um, doing this family therapy and, and, and then at some point supervising and kind of managing teams and administrating. And, but, but the day-to-day -day work with families and the, and the, the teenagers, um, for me, they taught me so much about love. And the biggest thing that what we're saying, like high-risk populations, those people called out to me over and over again and said, <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but I started falling in love with them more and more. And then I got lucky because I had a social worker who started referring a lot of her families to our program so that I would do the family therapy. And I asked her and she said, I get, I get different feedback from you about you and the way you show up in their homes. 
And I asked her one day, what is it? And he said, well, I, I would talk about cross-cultural communicative talk. You know what it is? You let them know as you get to know them that you, how much you love them. And, you, and it's okay for them to love you back. And then I thought about Bowlby and I thought about attachment. And it's really, if we take all the clinical terms out of it, is, am I willing to be impacted and be at risk here too? And go care in a situation where change might be small or, you know, or there's setbacks. We don't succeed with every person, every family. But am I willing to show up and love and, and love to love is to be vulnerable. Yeah. It's to risk yeah. for loss. And that, that was so humbling and uplifting and empowering to me that those families that I worked with those years, they live in me now. And they're with me when I'm doing that intensive. Somebody's flown in from Canada or somewhere, United States, for two day intensive with a family or a couple, and they've got resources and stuff. But you know who's really helping them get through it? Is those families I worked with those first 15 years. That they are inside me. They empowered me. They inspired me. They taught me lessons about life. And I saw, you know, yes, their attachment bonds are impacted by daily stresses, by by marginalization, by economic stress, it's by addiction, cross-generational transmission and their negative cycles, et cetera. But there were these places where I saw kinship care, community coming together and people finding ways to stay connected in spite of all that, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I still go and visit my mom who's this alcoholic, unrepentant, but I go see her because she's my mom and she was there for me. And I understood bonds in a way that I don't think I would have ever understood if I just skipped that agency experience. Yeah. That's what I got to say about that. So what you're saying is everyone should have an agency experience. <laughs> I think, yeah, mandatory like service, right? Or and I actually kind of last. agree. I think it's the hardest and most meaningful work that a clinician can probably ever do. And I, and I love what you're saying. It's like saying, you know, dare to be at risk, dare to be inspired by their human and, vulnerable and, and it, yeah. And to yeah. everybody out there listening that isn't an agency or remembering agency work, but particularly you guys that are on the front line, you're in that foreign mm-hmm. legion, whether you're working with people coming in with chronic mental illness diagnosis at a mental health center, or you're working in a child welfare center with abuse and neglect and, and trying to figure out how can this family be safe, or you're dealing with addiction, whether at that Medicaid level, underfunded programs, or you're dealing with you know, the, the agency where the funding's there, but the, the ability of that young person or whatever that adult to like bs is higher and you know you're dealing with court whatever it is i just hope we shared something today that inspires you a little bit and something that lets you know you're not alone in this um and the attachment-based work and eft and eft a great value and you may be working with clinicians that don't support that or a supervisor or an agency or whatever but hang in there um in the end, what you have on your side is this is the way people are wired and people want to be met as a person. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's the gift Sue gave us and Bowlby and all the people that came before us. Right. And I think for, you know, what you're saying, Jim, is that actually as an EFT clinician in an agency, we may likely be the only secure base that they've ever had the only person in that position who's shown them empathy and kindness and understanding and love. I know when you say that, I can hear like all the psychoanalysts or the psychodynamic folks like, oh, you said love the client. Oh my gosh. And they can love you back. But it's so powerful. I mean, love is bonding. Love is vulnerability and dare to be at risk with them. They'll touch your soul. Right. And those are the memories that make us wealthy. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. beyond words. Um, oh, wow. Jim, this is just so inspiring. I mean, I felt so touched so many times. Mm. And I was just right there, you know. And it was I was just remembering a lot of my own experiences in the agency. And just you meet some incredible, incredible people, mm. you know. And a lot of clinicians are missing out because they fail to see the humanness. They fail to align with the human. And they're really missing out on some powerful learning, some powerful bonding. 
Yeah, or and some are trying. They're trying, but they're not. Yes. They're not getting supported, or they're getting a message yes. to do something else, and and yeah. to not let your clients depend on you, and to not. Um, yeah, and that's hard. It's that's a hard place to be. Where, you know, a lot of times in private practice, the cost is where we may be on our own, but we can choose who we consult with and where we get support, and we can kind of come up with our practice parameters. Mm -hmm. And boy, I remember, you know, I'm, my my boss. It's like you get the family that give you, and you make it work. And um, that's a hard place to be at times, right? When you you get a family that yeah. scares you or rubs you the wrong way, or you get a client that's difficult and and it's it's hard work out there, man. And I applaud everybody who shows up every day to do tough work with with high risk people and in mm -hmm. often situations where the resources are limited. I love that the foreign legion. That's an amazing, amazing way to look at that. That is so beautiful. Wow, I I'm so inspired. This was just so much more. And and guys, if you're out there in the foreign legion, you know. Um, don't be afraid to align with the humanist, you know, we can be EFT warriors and, right. you know, and, and join the foreign legion. <laughs> Jim, right. do you have trainings on this? Can you, how can people? Oh, I know. Well, you know? yes, there's a, there's a related training, um, November 2nd and 3rd. Um, I'm doing a workshop with a colleague here who's a, a certified EFT therapist, uh, Cindy. And we're doing it on shame. Um, and we're talking about effectively working with shame, when dealing with addiction, when dealing with trauma, with dealing with, um, uh, um, and like in this agency work, like how do, we, how do we deal with shame with high risk populations and also with our sort of worried well, um, and really the opportunities uh, in working with shame. Um, and and uh, I'm really excited about that. I think that's gonna be a very exciting workshop. Um, and that's here in Denver. And that's something we've been invited to do by one of the addictions programs, Sandstone Care. So this is part of where, where I take in my Foreign Legion stuff is that I, I find myself in my private practice and at the center working at that intersection of addiction and trauma and, and pain and loss and shame and how they can kind of all intersect and get glommed together and leave people in pain and isolation. And my intensive practice for couples and families has become my version of a Foreign Legion um, but for people with more resources, you know, on the different work that I'm doing right now, and I have couples um, and families coming one at a time, you know, uh, from all around the U.S. and Canada now, and um, I just, I love that work. I, um, and I still go back and I consult with, I was just out in Utah working with a Ascend Recovery, a wonderful program, and spent two days with them um, and my colleague Amanda. Um, just working on how they can bring an attachment lens into their work with mostly young adults and their families, young adults that are struggling with addiction and need inpatient and then like a transition home, et cetera. So if you want to know more about what I'm doing, I, you can go to www.jimthomas.care. Um, jimthomas.care backslash intensives. If you know somebody that, or, you know, some, I get a lot of EFT therapists like to come for intensives because they want to do EFT and don't necessarily want to see their therapist out in their community and stuff. So that's, right. that's always available. Um, yeah. And, and, and like therapists that. can have you come out to their area to do a training in their area. Sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, there's a lot of good, and, and I can help you. Like if you want to find somebody to come, that's maybe more local, that's an EFT trainer into your agency. Um, you know, there, there's, there's good people amongst the, the mm -hmm. trainers. You know, a lot of us share this passion about agency work. And we'd be happy to, we want to come in and fuel your agency, right? Sure. And they can get in touch with you through your website. Yes. And then, um, and also the Colorado EFT.com, but jimthomas.care. Um, and I'll put links to this in in the description for this video so that everyone can have a okay good well and thank you for doing this these mm -hmm. talks are great and it's fun to listen to other EFTers uh, and the other talks you've done and we got to keep resourcing each other you know it's a tough yeah. world out there. And there's thank still uh, the attachment relational emotionally focused lens is still not the dominant one in the conversations yeah. but we need yeah. each other to keep fueled up and, so thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Jim.
so much. I can't thank you enough. This was amazing. This really was amazing. And I hope all of you were as touched as I was by this video. And make sure that you guys hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Thank <laughs> you.